would your next step be, Biggie? What would you try to do next? Uh, well, not say something more. What's more general than factor? You can't factor that really. What would you? What's a better? What's a, not a better word? But what's something like factoring? Fact, which is a, be more general. Try to simplify. That's what you're trying to do. You want to try to rearrange. It might be simplified, but does it really matter if you simplify? As long as you can plug in zero, it doesn't matter what it looks like, right? So maybe it'll look more simple, but maybe it won't. But the point is we need to see if we can do something here. What would you do? How would you simplify this? We have the limit as theta goes to zero. What would you do, everybody? Can you do anything to the top? Not really. That's sine, that's sine of cosine. Is that sine times cosine? No. What would you turn secant into? One over what? Cosine. 1 over cosine theta, and then limit as theta goes to 0, you end up with sine of cosine theta times what? Cosine. Can cosine theta. If you are lazy with your, can you see exactly what some people would simplify this to? If they were lazy, or they didn't write their parentheses correctly, what would they do? simplify to? That, can you do that? Is that cosine squared? No. no, 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 no it's not. But now what can you do? Yeah, what's the domain of sine? What's the domain of sine? No, that's the range. What's the domain of sine? All real numbers. What's the domain of cosine? All real numbers. Is there any division in this right now? No, so what's the domain of this function? So can you plug in anything? Yeah, so you can just plug in this. You end up with this equals sine of, this is the trickiest part of this equation, times cosine of zero. What's cosine of zero? What is it? One. Cosine is one. So what does this equal? Sine of one. Done. There it is. That's it. All they wanted you to do was rearrange this. That's it. By far the trickiest part I think is the remembering your trig value. Done. So what do we need to find? So let's rearrange the first one into sine. Oh wait, you don't know how to do that yet. Never mind. What do we have to use? What rule? Quotient rule. So y prime is going to be equal to low. What's the derivative of the top? Zero. Low d high what? Minus high. What's the derivative of sine? Sine x all over. Sine x plus cosine x. What are we plugging in? Y prime evaluated at? We want the slope, so we plug in what? Yeah. Zero. So you end up with negative cosine zero minus sine of zero all over sine zero plus cosine zero squared. What's cosine of zero? One. What's sine of zero? So it turns in, then uh, sine of zero again is plus. So what do you end up with? Negative one over, which is? So there's our slope. What was our point? Zero, one. So it's y minus one is equal to negative x minus zero. Stop there. You're done. If you wrote your answer like that on the next test, I would be totally fine with it. The only reason you need to go beyond this, well, there's one big reason and one very, very small reason. One, what's one simplification you could make to this that would be totally acceptable? Minus zero, you could just write it as x, that's fine. But if you leave it like that, that's fine. The biggest reason you're going to need to go anywhere for this for me is if I say write it in slope intercept form. Generally speaking, I will almost never ask you to do that. Why? Why do, why do I not want you to write it in slope intercept form? What are we preparing for? Yeah, so w why do you think I don't ask you to write it in slope intercept they form? Ask. They don't ask. It doesn't matter. This is the equation of a line. It's cosine x plus sine x times what? Correct. We're so close. We're so close. Can we cancel anything yet? Really? No. You have the exact same thing to cancel. Do we have the exact same thing? No. So someone tell me what we do. Someone very clearly tell me what we're so close that we can change this. One from the from the numerator. Yeah. So this equals, it, it doesn't matter. What does it turn into? Negative outside cosine x minus 
sine x over cosine x plus sine x times cosine x minus sine x. Now what cancels? That cancels with this, and you're left with the limit as x goes to pi over 4 of negative 1 over cosine x plus. What does that equal? Negative 1 over what? What's cosine of pi over 4? Exactly. And what's sine of pi over 4? So what do you end up with? Negative 1 over root 2. What's that equal to? Negative root 2 over 2. Now, you've been programmed to do this. What is this called? What is that process called? What did we do to the denominator? What type of number is the square root of 2? Irrational. Irrational. We've turned. So what did we do to the denominator? The denominator was, and it became, so what would you call that one word? We've, yeah, this is called rationalizing the denominator. This is another thing like slope-intercept form that you've been taught to do. Now, the biggest reason, now here, this is just, it comes down to me personally. The biggest reason I want you to generally, when it's not too much trouble, rationalize the denominator is can answers look pretty different if you don't rationalize the denominator? They can. I've gotten pretty good at kind of seeing it automatically, like doing the auto translate, what the rationalized and irrational denominators look like, the forms. But if I have to see it done too many different ways, it, it causes problems sometimes. On the AP test, do they care? Not generally, no. They never, they never say, I've never seen it said on the AP test, rational, make this 2 without the square root. Let's say it was just x squared plus 1. What's the derivative of x squared plus 1? 2x, you're done, right? What happens if I gave you uh, the square root of uh, x? Could you do the derivative of the square root of x? 1 half x to the negative 1 half, right? The problem, what's the, it's the combination of the two that seems to be the problem. If you wanted to try to figure this out without any new knowledge, how might you re rewrite this? You would make it f of x equal to what? To the what? To the 1 half, exactly. And then you think to yourself, well, maybe, let's just guess here, maybe the derivative is what? 1 half times x squared plus 1 to the? Like, hey, it's the, it's the power rule, right? That's, it seems like what we would do. I will tell you right now, this is not correct. But it is close. It is close to correct. We need to do something. And yes, I know some of you have read ahead. That's very good. Here is the chain rule right here. Here's the chain rule. And we'll go back to that same derivative. What this translates to, here's proper text. If f and g are both differentiable, and f composed of g is the composite function defined by capital F of x equals f composed of g, what does that mean? You're putting what function into the other? g into f, then this is the derivative. It's the derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside times the derivative of the inside. This is also the notation in Leibniz notation. You will see this written out this way right here. This is just another notation you need to be familiar with. What it boils down to is this, one phrase. Multiply by the derivative of the inside. So in this case right here, let's call this capital F of x just for to match the notation above. Let's just call it capital F of x. In this case, I'm going to write it out. If you had to write this as the composite of two functions, the outer function, what's the outer function going to be? What's the outer function? You already told me what it is. The outer function is what? It's the square root of x. What's the outer What's the function on the outside of everything? Square root. What's the inside function? x squared plus 1. What is this? What is f of g of x? What are you plugging into what? You're plugging in g of x into? That's the square root of g of x, which is what? Plus 1. What is f prime of x? 1 half x to the? You already told me that, right? Look what this definition said. It says capital F prime is going to be the derivative of f evaluated at g times g prime. So we need g prime as well. What is g prime of x? 2x. It says that derivative of f is going to be f prime g of x times what? g prime of x. So we're plugging g of x into the derivative of little f. 
we're plugging g of x into the derivative of little x. So we're taking this right here, g of x, and we're plugging it into that right there. So what does this become? f prime of x is therefore going to be 1 half times what? x squared plus 1 to the? But then what's on the outside? g prime of x right here. Let me get a different color here. g prime of x is on the outside. Do we have g prime of x? 2x. That right there is the derivative. Is it really close to what we guessed it would be? What's the only thing we had to tack on to the outside? The inside. What did I say up here? Multiply by the derivative of the inside. That's all we had to do. Can you simplify this a little bit? Sure. What's the advantage to leaving the answer like this, right? F f at least just for now? What's the advantage? It shows me you did it exactly the way I wanted you to do it. You're going to do so many of these that are you going to show out each of these steps every single time you take the derivative of a composite function? No. But if you show me this step at least, show me this form, am I going to be able to tell if you made a mistake? Yeah. What can you simplify out now? What's the one thing that cancels really nicely? Yeah, so if you wanted to simplify this, it would be x times x squared plus 1 to the. So you might see it like that, but what else could you do? You could get rid of the negative exponent by making it x over what? You might see it any one of these three ways. These are all correct. They're all the same. They're all the same. So on a multiple choice, on the AP exam, which, which form of the answer do you think is most commonly written? Which one do you think? The last one, actually. You generally see the last one, because they want you to do just a little bit more work to recognize the proper answer. That's just the way I see it. They also come up, kind of come up with a where they don't like negative exponents to be in there if they can avoid it. What's the outer function this time? So what do you do with that 2? So it's 2 times the inside. What power is it raised to now? 1. But what do we multiply by, Biggie? Cosine, Cosine x? Yeah. Why? Yeah, so you could write this out in multiple steps. You could say it's equal to the sine x. This is fun. That's the first power. What do I mean by that little mark right there? Derivative. What is the derivative of sine? That answer, that would be most, I would consider to be the cleanest answer right there. <coughs> Please be clean with your notation. Please be clean. Called. Basic algebra, right. So I want you to use basic algebra when you need to, but I don't want you to spend 90% of your time on a question doing algebra. If you ever find yourself spending 90% of your time on a problem doing algebra, probably there's a different way. Or you just should stop. OK. What's the, over, what's the outside function on number 5? E to the x. The inside function is sine x is being put into e to the x. So in this case, it's going to be y prime is the derivative of the first, e to the sine x, <laughs> times what? Yeah, that's it. There's no trick to it. That's it. e, the only tricky thing about e is that it's really simple. You'll be like, is she sure? And can someone tell me there's a problem here? That, that, those equal, that, the way this is written, this is not true right here. That is not true. Well, look, we're trying to prove that the derivative of a to the x is a to the x ln a. So there's a problem here. Why? Look, what is it log base a of a equal? That's e to the first to the x. This thing right here equals e to the x. That's not what it should be. It should be, it should be a to the x. Because look, that's what it's supposed to start with, right? OK, I'm going to say this again. What's the derivative of cx? C. What's the derivative of ln times x? ln. So look what happens here. We know that the derivative of e to some power is e to that power times the derivative of the top. What is the derivative of the top? ln a. That is the derivative of the top. I'm losing you. I can feel it. It happens. But we end up with this right here. We end up with the derivative of a to the x is e to the x ln a times ln a. But what is e to the x ln a? What is that equal to? It equals a to the x. That was our rearrangement from the front. 
So what we now have is this. This is what I need you to focus on. You can study this again. I did a very poor job of explaining that. The point is that you do some rearranging. And once you rearrange this, you are able to take the derivative. And once you get the derivative, it simplifies to this. Did you already know that to be true? Yes. What is j prime of x? Well, it's f prime of the inside, like this, times g prime of h times what? You can absolutely start this way and then just fill in the blanks. Absolutely. That's totally fine. This is exactly what we just did, but we had function values for f, g, and h. Same exact thing. Whatever you want to do is totally fine with me. I will tell you this. You're not going to do this every single time you see a chain. You're going to chain, power product, quotient chain, power product, quotient chain. Those are going to be just so here that you're going to leave, you're going to leave and go off into the world and become maybe mathematicians, but maybe not. You're going to remember power product, chain, and quotient, hopefully. I remember the law of cosines. I think I could lose my own name and forget everything about everything, and I would still remember the law of cosines. I'm not sure why, because the math class I learned it in wasn't particularly memorable, but apparently it was.